Hallelujah. Praise your name. May the peoples praise you, Lord. We are among the peoples, and we will praise your holy name. We will lift you high in this place today, for you are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy, Lord. And we are going to sing, you are worthy. We know, Lord, that you are worthy.
Hallelujah. Ooh. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just stay in an atmosphere of sensitivity to the Lord. Um, is there anyone here that has issues with their hand, like tremors, corporal tunnel, arthritis? If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Awesome. So I have one on stage. I'm gonna lay hands on him. Right, if that's you and you're out in the fellowship, would you just raise your hand? Yeah, there, okay, back there. Would you keep your hand up? Yeah, awesome. Let me just have some other believers go and gather around those that have their hands raised. Um, Chris, you can lay hands on your wife there in the sound booth, and she can receive, right, same Holy Spirit is present in the sound booth as on stage. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, I just felt this this morning. Yeah, and so, Lord, we come before you right now. Lord, and the promise of your Holy Spirit and the gifts is healing and miracles. And so we bring before you those that have issues with their hands right now, Lord. And we ask for trembling and tremoring to go away. We ask for like the tightening of, of any muscles, nerves, or ligaments causing corporal tunnel to be eased right now in Jesus' name. We ask for that, that cramping and that twisting and contorting that causes arthritis to be at peace right now in Jesus' name. Through the blood and the spirit, we rebuke sickness right now and we call forth healing, restoration, and deliverance into hands that they would be opened up right now to operate in their God-designed purpose. And we thank you, Lord, for the testimonies of your healing touch right now this morning. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, there's one other thing I want us to do. There's a camera in that sound booth right there that is broadcasting this morning's service. I would love for everyone to turn around and reach your hands towards that camera. And I specifically have in my spirit this morning, Pastor Don, Josie Saldana, and Martha Frank, right? I have had a burden for them all weekend. And so, Lord, right now, your Holy Spirit is present with our body of believers in their home. And I specifically bring before you right now, Lord, Josie and Pastor Don and Martha. And I ask Holy Spirit for you to move right now in the rooms that they are in. Restore their bodies to wholeness in Jesus' name. Lift them up off of their sickbed. Lord, Psalm 40 says, you will not leave us on our sickbed, but you will restore us. And so I'm asking right now for your restorative work to touch the members of this body of believers and bring healing and restoration and wholeness and deliverance to them by your power right now. And we thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen, amen. Woo, come on, let's give the Lord praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. You can make your way to your seats, love on somebody around you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, praise the Heavenly Father. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. We can release the kids to head back to Kids Church. And um, it is time for our tithes and offerings. Hallelujah. <laughs> so if I could get the ushers uh, to prepare for that, I want to bless our tithes and offerings Today, I am talking about encouragement and encouraging, right? It's the second E in our missions statement, and I am really excited to be able to share because I think our church does this really well. Um, I think we are such an encouraging and an uplifting body of believers that it is such a joy to me uh, to see that in this community. And one of the areas that you do that really excellently is in your giving, 
right? You encourage in your giving, in your tithes and offerings, in your missions giving, uh, the way that we are able to support those that are doing work for the kingdom around the world is awesome. And so this morning, I just want to bless those tithes. I want to bless those offerings and take that before the Lord. So if you're husband and wife, you can join hands. If you're family, you can join hands together. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you are so faithful. That, Lord, you call us to be faithful. And in simple areas, Lord, like our tithes and offerings, you respond to faithfulness with faithfulness. And so as we give this morning, Lord, in our tithes, in our offerings, in here, in this house, and unto the ends of the earth, I ask that you would bless the gift that's given, that every penny, Lord, would be used rightly for your kingdom. And I ask that you would bless those who are giving, that, Lord, as they give, they would know, Lord, they can't out-faithful you. And when they obey in simple ways, you respond in great ways. And so we bless this offering this morning, Lord. We give it to you from a joyful heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go ahead, ushers. Well, hallelujah. We have a lot of announcements this morning. <laughs> and so be sure that you get the bulletin uh, that has all of them listed. I'm just gonna go over a couple of them together. Uh, this Wednesday night coming up is Valentine's. So if you haven't already booked a nice restaurant and have a hot date with your wife or your girlfriend, because that should be on you guys. They shouldn't be the one booking it. <laughs> If you haven't already done that, you can come out and join us here on Wednesday night. Uh, if you are a single person and you want to watch couples embarrass themselves terribly, also come out and join us on Wednesday night for free dessert and coffee and fellowship. Uh, we're going to have an awesome time together. We've got giveaways and stuff like that that are a part of that. And so that will be in the fellowship hall at 7 o'clock. Uh, then on Sunday is our business meeting. So please be sure at six that you are here to hear uh, how the Lord has blessed this house and things that are on my heart for the future in this house and everything the Lord is doing as a part of that. Uh, we also have Meet Me at the Bridge on Saturday at noon uh, there across from the ballpark downtown. And so for those of you that love to be a part of that, please go and be a part of that. Uh, so this Wednesday is Valentine's. The following Wednesday, uh, we have a couple uh, that are coming to be with us that we're really excited about as well, Simon and Justice. And uh, he is a soldier with the IDF. Uh, and so he's gonna be sharing about stuff that's going on in Israel uh, from firsthand uh, experience. And so we're gonna have an opportunity to hear from them on the 21st. And then on the 25th is a single ladies lunch 
all of the single ladies celebrated, cheered. I, I don't know what single ladies do, but <laughs> um, whatever you do, you can do that together at the single ladies lunch. Um, that will be uh, on the 25th after church at Hope Valley Diner. So uh, if you need more information on that, please see Miss Teresa. And then, beginning that Sunday, is our Love Life Adoption Week. Uh, And we uh, are a part, you know, of absolutely standing and believing for the Lord to completely end abortion in America and for every child born to have the best life possible through their birth parent, through adoption, right, as the Lord sees fit. And so we are a part in our community of standing with organizations that support life. And this is one of those. And so on the Saturday, the 2nd of March, is our Love Life Prayer Walk at the Chapel Hill uh, location. And so please, if you have a desire to be a part of that, come out and be a part of that. It's a simple thing that we can do together as a church to stand and believe for life. Over the years, my wife and I have done prayer stands at different abortion clinics in different places around the nation and also in front of the Supreme Court uh, when they were hearing different cases on those issues. And so our prayers work. They work, right? There is, it makes no sense in the natural for Roe versus Wade to be overturned in America but God, right? And that is because of the prayers of the saints. I absolutely believe we have a great effect in those areas and things that are moved in the spiritual are moved in the natural. Amen? Awesome. So let's jump into this morning's message together. Uh, You know, last week we talked about exalting the Lord, and how as we exalt the Lord, as we lift high his name, the outflow of that is growing closer to the Lord. The outflow of exalting his name is being drawn more near to him because he abides, right? Scripture says he abides in the praises of his people. But the awesome thing is exalting God doesn't just draw us near to him, right? It also builds us up as a community because when we exalt the Lord together, we are drawn closer to each other, which that leads me then to what's this week's E, our second E, which is encouraging, right? Encouraging one another. And this is a huge thing right? Encouraging. Because in a minute, I'm going to give you some stats about the state of our nation. And let me just say, people need encouragement, right? It's the simple truth. People need encouragement. And so the second E, right, in our mission statement says this, we're encouraging Christians to devote themselves to God's purpose in their lives. Encouraging Christians to devote themselves to God's purpose in their lives. Now, what's the big deal with that? Well, let's look at scripture and see what the big deal with that is. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25 says, let us hold unswerving, that's important, unswerving, unmoved, to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. That's hugely important. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit. The writer of Hebrews thousands of years ago said, people have the habit of not getting together, right? It has become all the more clear today People have the habit of not getting together, right? Especially post-COVID. How many churches have closed and not reopened because people stopped getting together? But then he goes on to say, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching, right? What day is he talking about? He's talking about the day the Lord returns, right? We should be getting together and we should be encouraging one another, and we should be doing it more, not less, more as we draw near to the day the Lord returns, which is now, (laughs) right? More than it was when the writer of Hebrews wrote Hebrews, now is nearer the day of the Lord's return. 
So now is the time people need encouragement more than they've ever needed it before. It's just a simple truth, right? I, there were so many statistics that I could have pulled this week as I was looking at this particular topic. And as I was looking at, at the need for encouragement and the level of discouragement that's going on in people's lives and in society. But I grabbed just a few that I, I just want, I'm gonna read them off to you this morning. A study in 2018, pre-COVID, a study in 2018 found that 50% of Americans say they have no meaningful in-person interactions on a daily basis. Half of society goes through a day without having a meaningful interaction with someone. 28% of Americans 60 and older live alone. 20% of them say they are lonely and isolated. 20% of those 60 and older say they're lonely and isolated. 40% of Americans in the study said they feel their social relationships hold no real value. 40% say that they hold no real value. A long-term study of 700 men, which was actually looking to, to find other things out, but something that they discovered by accident in a long-term study of 700 men, this study spanned over 50 years. A long-term study of over 700 men. Do you know what it found? Those men in the study group that had meaningful interactions with other men had a lower level of heart disease and heart risk than those men that did not. Interacting with other men actually brought them better and greater health. A 2006 study on breast cancer patients found that those that had friends that supported them in their treatment were four times more likely to be cancer free when their treatment finished than those that did not have friends supporting them. Four times higher rate. Why? Because there was something about having someone there encouraging you along the way that brought you strength in your body. There was something there about having people supporting you in a time of need that brought increase and health and wholeness. Do you know it's been found that there's actually power in a compliment. I don't know if you've seen this or not, but a study was done about the effects that compliments had on people. And, and they would watch people's uh, interactions with cameras. They would hook people up to sensors and see what would happen when someone would come along and speak a, a word of encouragement, a word of love to them. Do you know what they found? They found for when people would have words of, of love or encouragement spoken to them, it would actually cause their pupils to dilate and show more color. It would cause their lips to get more red. It would cause their heart rate to increase, which then caused their skin tone to strengthen. Right, All of these effects just from speaking encouragement to one another. So when you're coming in to the church and someone says to you, wow, you look really nice today, without even realizing it, right? Your heart rate increases, right? Your body actually begins to get more attractive, right? Which is why Valentine's is so important, men in this room. <laughs> when is the last time you gave your wife a compliment about how amazing she was, right? But genuinely, beyond that, as the body of Christ, we should be those at the forefront of encouragement. We should be those leading the way, speaking love and life and hope to those around us. Right, you take that word encouragement there, and the scriptures I have for you this morning, I picked all New Testament scriptures, because I wanted to think of encouragement in the sense of today. Right, but you... You take that word encouragement and you look at it in the Greek language, right? And that word means, right, to call near, to invite, to comfort, right, and to strengthen, right? So every time you encourage someone, right, you're, you're calling near, 
right? You're inviting interaction with them, right? You're comforting them. You're strengthening them. You're encouraging them. I I met with a wonderful couple this week who were very moved out of last Wednesday's message. And I'm hoping and believing they get to see the greatness of God. But I sat down to, to lunch with Kevin and Rita on Thursday of this week. And they shared with me that coming out of Wednesday night and the message on healing, that they were driving to South Carolina to lay hands on a friend who was dying of kidney disease and believe for God to raise that friend up. And they sat down with me this week and they asked, Pastor, what are some things you would share with us in going to do this? And we, we met for about an hour together just speaking words of love and life and encouragement to one another. It was so wonderful. And they left straight away from that to drive five, five and a half hours to South Carolina to pray for this friend. It's where they are this weekend. They're down there with that person. But it was so wonderful, like that time of encouragement together, right? And it like stirred me up because I was going from meeting with them to meeting with a missionary that's based from here in Durham, that's full-time in Egypt, um, ministering among literally people that live in the trash. It's called trash cities. Uh, I don't know if you know that in some foreign countries, people literally live and make homes out of, out of the cities of trash. But this missionary is full-time in Egypt and I met with them. And, and I was going in between those meetings, right? And as a pastor sitting down with someone who's going to pray and believe the fullness of the word of God over a friend gets me stirred up. To be honest, gets me stirred up because I realize like they're being encouraged and the trickle effect is they're now going out to encourage someone else, right? So as I'm leaving from that meeting with them at Panera, I, I was headed out the door of the restaurant and as I was leaving, there was an older woman who I would consider in this day and age to be a grandma, helping an older woman who I would consider to be a great grandma, right? <laughs> Without like putting age on it, that was the realm of life these two women were in. And, and they were having a difficult time going across the parking lot because the older of the two women was on a walker and, and they were going very slow. And listen, I will admit to you, oftentimes, I'm like so like caught up with a hundred different things in my head in any given moment that I don't put a lot of forethought into my surroundings. My wife will say that to me. She'll go, did you not see that? And I'll go, oh, I didn't see that at all. And she'll be like, well, praise the Lord, we didn't die. <laughs> and I'm like, thanks, babe. You saw it though, right? And so I was headed out the door and it just flashed through my mind that they needed help and encouragement. And so I stopped and I turned around and I went back and I held the door open for them. And I said, ladies, I hope you're having an amazing and wonderful day together. Church family, they immediately lit up and were like, oh, we are. And I was like, wonderful. I hope you enjoy your meal together. And I just stood there and held the door for them coming across the parking lot and they were not moving rapidly. And the entire time, I just poured out, like, encouragement, love, life to them until they passed through, and the last thing I said was, enjoy the rest of your day. I hope you have a great time together. And then I went on my way, right? Did it take a little bit of my time? Yeah. Should it matter? No. Because as a Christian, I should prioritize being like Christ to the people around me. And you regularly see Jesus speaking words of love and life and encouragement to people that are going through terrible and difficult things, that are in very low places in life, that think that they've been abandoned and overlooked by everyone else, like a prostitute caught in the act of adultery, who's cast at Jesus' feet, right? What does he do? In that situation, he speaks to those around her, and when they've all left, what does he do? He encourages her and he says to her, listen, your accusers are gone. Now go and sin no more, right? Don't return to the life you've once lived. Get out of that life and move forward, right? He didn't belittle. He didn't condemn. No, no, no. He called her up in strength. He called her up in encouraging her to leave that life behind and move forward into what is available for her. As the body of Christ, we should be doing the same thing, 
right? This is a place that should be constantly filled with encouragement to one another, right? By the time a visitor comes into this place and leaves on a Sunday, they should have heard an encouraging word from two or three different people in this place. And if they haven't, we're missing something as the body of Christ, right? We're falling a little bit short of the goal, Because church shouldn't just be about me coming in to get something just for me from this gathering. You can do that in a podcast. You can do that watching God TV, right? When I come into this place, it should be about the joy of the fellowship of the body of Christ. It should be about speaking words of love and life to one another and calling each other up in the kingdom of God. That's what churches, that's why when the writer of Hebrews said, listen, the closer we get to the day of the Lord, don't neglect this. Don't stop this. You need it more then. Why? Because he knew that the world was going to get more difficult. He knew that the world was going to be more discouraging and more harsh. Listen, it's obvious that the world is that way, just go on any social media, right? Everyone now lays their opinion out there for everyone else to see whether they've asked for it or not. And they give just as much negative in that as they do positive. Right? They, they lay just as much stuff out there. But here's the thing. To counter that, there are also people who are putting things out there on social media because they're lonely, because they're discouraged. And so they're posting things like, man, you know, today's a really tough day. Man, today's like the worst. Man, I'm having such a hard time. And in moments like that, it's up to us as the body of Christ to see that and to call them up. I'm sure a lot of you, if you follow the media at all, you know what recently happened with Elmo, right? If you don't, let me explain it to you in in simple terms. Elmo, right, and Elmo's social media, the puppet from Sesame Street, yes, I'm talking about a Sesame Street puppet, (laughs) right? Elmo, social media hadn't, nothing had been posted for quite some time, months and months. And then Elmo posted on Elmo's social media asking people how they were doing. Hey, everyone, how's it going out there? Seems like things aren't going great, right? I'm paraphrasing. And within a couple of hours, church family, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of responses. Barely putting food on my family's table. Found out I'm super sick, right? It was like heart-wrenching to see the responses. But then do you know, church family, barely over a week after that, Right? People realizing, oh my gosh, the world is in a rough place right now. People are in a bad state right now. Right? A morning talk show ask Elmo to come on and be positive and, and speak uplifting things. And instead, the cartoon puppet Elmo went on that morning show and was assaulted by a comedian telling the puppet to shut up and stop asking people how they're doing. This all actually happened in the last two weeks in our society. It shows you the state of discouragement the world is living in right now when famous and well-known people would rather shut someone else up who's asking than have to look at the state of things and address it. But God, right, we are different, right? We are called to be set apart. We are called to speak and to call and to love and to uplift and to encourage and to strengthen one another even when the world is not. Because the ripple effect from that will radically change lives. It will radically change lives, right? A a silly little example of that. Right, a couple of weeks ago, some of you were here with us when when some spiritual sons and daughters of Sharon and I came and ministered, Ben and Kelsey Patton. Right, Ben and Kelsey are missionaries in a Muslim nation that are seeing great and awesome acts of God. They're seeing people getting saved. They're seeing churches planted. They're seeing a whole region be touched by the power of God. But if you take Ben and Kelsey from where they are now, 
and you rewind their story like six, seven years, do you know what you find? You find another set of missionaries sitting in a coffee shop, JJ and Jane Marie Newell. You also met them. That couple has a conversation with this couple. At that point in time, Ben and Kelsey didn't believe in anything in relation to the Holy Spirit and his power today. They were actually in a school that taught otherwise, right? Cessationism. They were in a school that taught otherwise. But they meet this couple, and they're so encouraged in their interaction with them that they continue to meet with them. And then J.J. and Jane Marie had to go back to Africa. So what do they say to Ben and Kelsey? You should sit down with our pastor. So then this couple sets up a meeting with me. They come in to my office expecting and anticipating to show me how wrong I am about the Bible. I'm okay with that. They're not the first ones that have tried to do that with me about what I believe in Scripture. But God begins to set their heart on fire. But God begins to bring his word to life in them. And the next thing you know, a couple of months later, they're in services at our church where the power of God is being made known. And they get radically touched and changed. Then they go to their cessationist Bible school and for the first time ever ask if they can do an internship at a spirit-filled church. And for some wild reason, their Bible school says yes and lets him intern under me at New Life, the church I used to work at. He begins to do that and is now constantly around people who are in love with the Lord, encouraging one another, speaking life, calling the gifts up and out in them. So then they go on a trip and have their hearts set on fire. Then they go through training. Then they begin to fundraise and join the mission field, right? And then they're seeing the great things of God made known and made manifest. And then they have children, right? And come back to the States to be with their family. And while being here, they want to continue to be a part of the relationship that they've developed with us. So what do they do? They visit and they're a part of the installation service, praying over my wife and I. And then they come back and minister with us on a Wednesday night. And you pour out tremendous blessing to them in finances because they poured blessing into you in the testimonies of what God's doing. And both parties are encouraged. And now they take those finances and they go back to Zanzibar and you take the stir from the Spirit of God in you, which gets you excited about future missionaries coming and what the Lord might do through them in here in Bethel. And now all of a sudden, the kingdom begins to branch off in places of encouragement, right? Because now the finances you've given them is encouraging them when they return to the mission field and those finances are now doing what? Training more people in that nation, raising up more pastors, building churches so that what can happen there? More souls can be won and more Muslims are converted. And now all of a sudden that encouragement begins to branch out there. But for you back here, having been encouraged by them, now when your pastor comes and says, I'm gonna bring another missionary in, you're not like, oh, a missionary, right? It's not like, and this is a slideshow of my wife and a monkey. My wife is the one on the left, right? It's not like that. Right, they come in and talk about how God's closing brothels and converting Islamic families and they're seeing miracles and that gets you stirred up to what? To believe the Bible is actually true the way we know it is. And now all of a sudden when another missionary comes in, you're excited to be a part of that and you want to come in and hear what God's doing with them and encourage them and bless them and it just continues to branch out into this unbelievable tree of life all from a simple encouragement that started in a coffee shop seven years ago. That's the body of Christ or it should be. That's what we should be doing as members of the kingdom of a father that loves us beyond measure and a son that died for us and gave us his spirit to live within us as what? As our comforter and encourager. One third of the Trinity is in us every day as a comforter and an encourager. So then how much more should we as the body of Christ be pouring him out to those around us? as encouragement and comfort to them. And this should be so foundational to us, but so often it's not because we get so distracted to the left or to the right in the way the world presents things and stuff that's going on. 
Our heart is regularly, and mine is too, is regularly broken by the failure in the church of today. I'm so tired of turning on the news and seeing another church leader fall or fail in some way. And so what does that do? That fuels discouragement. When that's the way the world, and that's the majority of what the world sees in relation to the church. But we, as the body of Christ, can shift that. We can change that. When although that's what the world is presenting them, when they meet us, And we are filled with love and life and encouragement. When we're calling each other up, right? When we're loving one another well, when we're honoring each other and encouraging one another, it can shift and change that in so many people's lives. And that's what I want for Bethel. I want us to be a church that is filled with encouragement. I want us to be a church that cheers each other on. I want us to be a church that is filled with words of love and words of life. After our installation uh, meal a couple of weeks ago, one of our church members was sharing with me something that was going on with someone. And she said, after sharing that with me, she said, the great thing is we're a small church that knows each other's business but we don't allow that to change the way we view one another. And I thought, that's very interesting. It's very interesting that you can know the business of someone around you and that doesn't cause you to look less upon them. Because oftentimes in the world, that's exactly what happens. Right? But when we realize we are all sinners saved by grace, when we realize we've all received the same mercy of the living God, when we realize the same Holy Spirit lives in every one of us and that there but the grace of God go I, all of a sudden it begins to change our mindset and our perspective about how we view one another. Now all of a sudden, instead of looking down on someone in a struggle, no, 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 we want to go and call them up out of their struggle because we know at some point we have struggled or will struggle like them and our hope is that someone else will call us up and encourage us out of our struggle and so why not let me be the first domino that starts this? And then all of a sudden we see that when we come together, although there's a lot going on among us, We're encouraging each other all the more towards the plans and purposes of God in us, to us, and through us. This has to be foundational for us at Bethel. This has to be, and listen, it's part of our mission statement, right? And let me just say, it's a mission statement that I inherited. It's not one I've created. But in looking at it, my wife and I loved it so much, we didn't feel like there was changes that needed to be made because it's so foundational, exalting, encouraging, equipping, evangelizing, right? Like that should be the foundation of every church. And so I'm not here to pastor any other church. I'm here to pastor Bethel. And so I want to see this church be a church that's filled with encouragement. I want this to be a church that's loving, not just well, but loving excellently those around us in the body of Christ pouring out for one another, even when it's not easy, even when we don't understand or don't have the full details of what's going on. Listen, church family, let us not gossip down. Let us call up, right? If I don't know what's going on in someone's life, I'm not gonna tell someone else. I'm gonna wait until I have the full details so I'm not making a situation worse than what it actually is, changing or altering anyone's perspective of that person or that situation. I'm going to keep my mouth shut until I know exactly what's going on so then I can encourage them and call them up into what God has for them. That's who we're to be as sons and daughters of the living God because that's what Jesus is doing for us. I love, you know, 1 Thessalonians speaks to this as well. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, it says, and we urge you, brothers and sisters, Warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure no one pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Don't pay back 
wrong for wrong, right? Don't look down on one another. No, 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 no. Encourage each other. Build each other up. But listen, it also says, right, don't put up with things that aren't right. Right, don't, don't allow things to, to go on the way that they've been. No, 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 call those people in, into a greater life. Call them into a stronger life. Encourage them. There are so many people that I know that have battled or struggled in one way or another. And me, I'll just use the issue of pornography. I've worked with so many young men over the years that have battled the issue of pornography. And let me just tell you, going to them and speaking down to them about the sin that they're struggling in doesn't help them. But going to them and looking them in the eyes and saying, you can do this. Greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. The Lord will show you a way out if you'll turn to him. Right, going to them and giving them encouragement and strengthening them calls them out of a life of sin and into a life of what's possible with the living God. Because the Lord is fully capable. Fully capable. I've worked with marriages that have, like, the couples were already separated and meeting with divorce lawyers when they would come to sit down with me. And one of the first things I'll do is, when when I meet with with a couple, is, especially a couple in a really difficult situation, I'll say, tell me five things you love about your spouse. Right? I could start with, tell me all the things that they're doing wrong, but that's not where I start. You want to know why? Because they've already been telling each other that for the last two years. I'll go, tell me five things you love about your spouse. And, and sometimes it's difficult for them because they've been so hyper-focused on the negative that remembering and recalling the positive is not easy. But then once we start pulling those strings, right? once we start calling those things out, it begins to shift and change things. Why? Because their perspective and what they're focusing on has been shifted. Now they're not focusing on the negative and the world. Now they're focusing on the positive and what God can do in them. I'll say, what led you to fall in love with that person? What's something awesome God did for you early in in your relationship? And it's amazing to see as you begin to call out encouragement in them, they then begin to call out encouragement in each other. They'll say things like, well, you know, over time, I have really focused on this, and and it's not as bad as as what I thought it was, and and I realize I could probably go a little bit easier on you in this area if you can also work on this thing. And that spouse will go, you know what, I I totally realize I have, like, kind of slid back a little bit in that area. I can do that for you. You know, and all of a sudden, now what's happening is they're beginning to encourage each other, and the moment they begin doing that, it starts strengthening their marriage. That's the way we need to be as the body of Christ. The world outside of our four walls is giving everyone enough negativity. And listen, let me just say, we're in an election year. It's only going to get worse, (laughs) right? 80% of the commercials in an election year are smear commercials, right? Like this person does this wrong, and this person does this wrong, and this person does this wrong, right? You're going to get plenty of that. Anti-Semitism is up almost 400% in the last year. That's mind-blowing to me. 388% increase in a year. Talk about discouragement. But we, as the body of Christ, we're here to encourage. We're here to encourage people. I went through something yesterday unintentionally that like kind of stabbed me in the heart. It was pretty discouraging to me. And it's the first time I've like can remember blatantly encountering something like that. It was a gorgeous day out yesterday. I had gone to the gym and had played basketball in our neighborhood with my oldest daughter. And I thought I was done for the day. And my oldest daughter asked if we could go for a jog together because she and I will run together sometimes. And so we went out and, and ran, I ran a mile with her in our neighborhood. I was super tired after having gone to the gym and run a mile with my oldest daughter. And my youngest daughter was like, dad, I want to go on a mile jog with you. So I was like, oh, great. Sure. Sure. 
And as I was out, running with my youngest daughter, I was, I believe, unintentionally, but I was very heavily racially profiled. And some middle-aged black women began to curse at me over my interaction with my daughter. And it was like, it was so piercing to my heart. Because I don't remember having been cursed at so vilely over anything with my daughters. We have had some questions asked, sure. But I've never had anyone start in such a vile and angry place. And for my six-year-old to say, Dad, what are those words that they're using? Why are they talking to you like that? And for me to tell her, babe, they're just confused. Like, let's keep going together. Like, even now, my hands tremble at what went on. And I believe it was unintentional. I believe they were concerned for a black child they thought was playing in the neighborhood and an older white guy that was you know, interacting with that child. I believe it was very unintentional. And I think if they actually knew me, it wouldn't have gone that way. Because all the people around our home know us and are very friendly to us. And they are of every skin tone and multiple different nations of the world. But that situation was different. And I got home and for a couple of hours, I had to fight the thoughts of discouragement that attempted to enter into my mind. And I'm just being very honest and frank with you. Durham is not my place of birth. It is not a city I have grown up in. But I can tell you, I've already had multiple pastors in this city come to me and say, well, you have to understand the difference in black culture and white culture here in Durham. And you have to understand the divide that's been created. And you have to understand. And they're meaning well, but they're doing it in a very discouraging way. In their well-meaning because listen, there is no divide in glory, right? Every language and tribe and tongue and nation is before the throne, saying worthy is the lamb. And so having those thoughts in the back of my mind from what other pastors have told me about coming into Durham, and then having that interaction take place concerning my daughter and I, I began to have thoughts of, man, Lord, like, will I be able to pastor well people coming from different cultural backgrounds? Will I be able to interact well with people in Durham if they judge me this harshly without actually knowing me? And I had to fight off discouragement. And honestly, the way that I did that was about an hour to two hours past and my wife said that she wanted pizza for dinner. And so I said, sure, let me, let me go to the pizza place. And my youngest, again, asked if she could go with me. She, she prefers me. She likes me most. <laughs> my youngest asked if she could go with me. And she climbed in. And she sings all the time. She's constantly singing. She climbed into my truck, and we put on, like, these like a Spotify album of like kids' praise music. It was so ridiculous. And she's just in the back seat singing away, and I was just praying in tongues, talking to the Lord. And we got to the pizza place, and we went in, and as we were coming out, one of the workers there stopped me and said, you and your daughter are so cute together. And I said, thank you. And it was like, that was that little thing the Lord did for me that like broke the back of discouragement to encourage me, right, that I am on the right track. And it meant the world to me. I literally got into my truck and I just said, thank you, Lord. Thank you. And later that night, my wife, I was like, how are you doing? And I was like, I'm okay now, you know? I'm, I'm better than I was. And, and it was all because of a simple encouragement that offset a heavy discouragement. Because listen, that person was a stranger. She didn't have to tell me what she thought about my daughter and I. She chose to, church family. She chose to interact with a 
total stranger to say an uplifting thing to them. We, as Christians, have got to choose that as often as we can, especially as we draw nearer and nearer the return of the Lord, because the world is not, right? The world is not, so we must. We have to be the tip of the spear in encouragement and love and comfort and strength to those around us, because that's what the Lord did for us slow to anger and abounding in love was the model he set. And so he calls us to follow after him in that pursuit. And so my challenge to you this morning is, as we think about Bethel, as we think about who we are as a people, I want this place to be filled, like I talked about last week with worship, exalting and lifting high the name of the Lord, but I also want this place to be filled with encouragement to where we are cheering each other on, we're lifting each other up, we're loving each other well. Because when we're doing that, it will strengthen people to be the way Christ created them to be. Amen? Amen. Matt, would you just come back up to the keys for me? You may be at a place where you're battling discouragement. You may be at a place where you're going through something difficult. Let me challenge you this morning. You can come out of your place of discouragement by encouraging someone else. You can battle against that thing that you're going through by choosing to be different towards others. And as I was thinking about encouragement I just threw together, and I, hopefully they'll have it on the screen for you, like eight little areas, right, that we can choose to encourage someone, right? Like speaking words of love to them, writing a little note to them. Do you know how it's, I love, I love getting a card in the mail. Maybe it's like that weird thing in me, I don't know, I'm, I'm a sanguine, a high eye, an outgoing personality, but when someone just writes a little note, like a postcard or a little card and drops it in the mail and it's like, man, we really love you, you know, we miss you, we hope to see you again. I just like, that gets me worked up, right? Helping someone, right? You can encourage them by showing up to just be alongside them in something they're going through, right? By giving to someone, just like Ben and Kelsey, right? It was such an encouragement to them that they were here on a Wednesday night and walked away with such a wonderful love offering from like 40 of you that were here that night. Right? There are other things you can give. Right? If you know someone likes a particular little thing, I love to give people like books or, or different things that, like that that I know that they like. I love to give people like desserts or, or chocolates or things like if I know they have a sweet tooth because I have a sweet tooth. Right? So like there's a camaraderie in it. Right? But your presence, just being there with them. I, I had a good friend that his mom went through a heart transplant, successfully recovered, was doing so wonderfully, and then was taken out by a super, super, super rare disorder. And I remember the grief he was going through because his mom had successfully had a heart transplant and then to be lost to this crazy rare disorder. And I remember one day, the Lord was like, just go and sit with him. And I just went and sat in the same room that he was in. Just sat in the room for hours. Just sat with him, didn't say anything because I didn't have anything to say. But just our presence together. A couple of months ago, as my wife and I were preparing for this transition, he literally wrote me a text referring back to that day that I just showed up at his house and sat with him. And he was like, you have no idea what that meant to me. Everyone wanted to tell me what God was doing. He's like, you were just willing to be with me. And it meant so much to me to know that it meant something to him because I was just obeying the Lord. But sometimes your presence is an encouragement. Sometimes it's a simple touch, a hug, right? A hand on the shoulder, simple little things right? Hospitality. Just reaching out to say, hey, how are you? What's going on? Thinking of you today. Praying, right? There's, these are simple little ways that we can be a people of encouragement, 
but find one of these things. Find one of these eight things. And this week, like walk that out. Reach out and pray with a friend over the phone. Get together with someone and cover lunch. Send a note through the mail or, or leave it on a coworker's desk. We, in the past, we had this young lady that worked with the ministry we worked with. Her name then was Alicia Vareville. Now it's Alicia Norton. And she was the most genuinely engaging person I've ever known. Like I would be in the middle of work and she would come in and pull a chair up beside me and put her hands on her knees and put her head in her hands and go, tell me how your day is. And I would know she was not going to leave my office until I turned and gave her eye contact and conversation. And I just remember, like, it would do something in me. And I would hear her in other people's offices doing the same thing. She would pull up a chair beside them and say, hey, how are you? Hey, what's going on with your mom? She was the most, like, encouraging and uplifting and, and loving person. And, it, and it, she just overflowed with it. But I remember years ago, we had a group of friends. We were going from Kansas City out to Vail, Colorado to go skiing together. And I had a friend who had survived a, a crazy medical situation, super outdoors oriented guy, had survived a crazy medical situation and was driving the multi-passenger van. We're all in there. We're having fun together. She was in the passenger seat. And I remember she looks over at him and Sharon and I were sitting in the, the next seat back. My wife can confirm this. She looked over at him and she goes, tell me a really difficult story from your childhood involving your father. Like that. And he had sunglasses on and he just pulls his sunglasses down like this and looks at her over top of him and goes, no. <laughs> she did not know what to do for like the next hour. She sat there just like, like forlorn that he had like shut down her desire to engage in him, with him in conversation. And my wife and I had to like put our hands over our mouths as we chuckled because we knew her heart was so pure in that moment. And I don't know that she had ever faced such like strong discouragement to engaging together. And we just like chuckled at what we saw, right? Let us be like her. Let us be the ones that are choosing engagement. And if someone shuts us down or closes us out, it's not because we didn't try, it's because they didn't reciprocate. But as far as us and the church, as far as Bethel is concerned, let us be sons and daughters of encouragement to those around us and those in our community and those online and those we interact with. Let us be a spirit-led people because he is a spirit of encouragement. So let us follow the Lord's lead. Amen? Amen. Stand with me this morning. I just want to bless you. If you would, just hold out your hands with me this morning. Lord, I pray over every person in this room. I pray even right now, Holy Spirit, that you would begin to speak to them about being an encourager. That you would give them someone this week that they can reach out to in one of these eight ways, Lord and encourage that person. That if there's someone in this room, Lord, that needs encouragement, first, Holy Spirit, I ask you would be their encourager. But then I ask equally and right on the tail of that, that you would send someone else from this community or someone else around them to encourage them. That we would be a people known for being filled with love and life and joy in the Holy Spirit. That this E of our mission statement and encouragement. Lord, we would be known in our community as a church that encourages, that calls up, that strengthens those around us. And I thank you for that right now. And so I just pray, Lord, that you would bless everyone in this room, that you would watch over them, that you would keep them, that your face would shine upon them and they would go in the peace of the living God. And I thank you, Lord, for who you are in us, to us, and through us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Love you, Bethel Church family. If you need prayer this morning for anything, if you need someone to stand and agree with you for encouragement, don't leave this place until you find one of our leaders. Right? Talk to, to you know, uh, Miss Carol. Talk to Matt and Ann. Talk to Sharon and I. Talk to someone that you know that loves the Lord around you and let us stand with you on anything that you need. Amen. Love you all. Have a wonderful Sunday. And also tonight, as you're watching the Super Bowl, encourage the Chiefs for a win.